The views expressed by the host of this podcast are not opinion-based or for entertainment purposes. They are actually facts and truth, no matter if other people like it or not. It is the Detroit sports truth, and nothing can ever stop it from being correct. Hey there, Detroit sports fanatics, and welcome to episode 179 of the Detroit of the Detroit Sports Truth on Spreaker. I'm Taylor Phillips, and I'm with my top co-host on the podcast, Ed Smith. Thanks so much for being on the, on here. How are you? Uh, doing fine, Taylor. A little bit tired after a long, hard day at work, but I'm chilled, relaxed, and ready to roll. That's good. Uh, tonight, we're going to recap... It, in this episode, we're going to recap the Lions losing to the St. Louis Rams 21-14, we're going to uh, dig out Eric Ebron still ripping the referees and still getting that, that stupid Detroit versus everybody slogan campaign going. Um, we'll talk about the Red Wings keeping on blowing leads in the final minutes of regulation and finally paying for it in regulation. The Pistons also blowing one after uh, crushing... Indiana and taking care of Philly. And then we go to uh, college hoops. Spartans hang on against Florida. The Gators in a 2000 in a national championship rematch in a 2000 national championship rematch. Michigan basketball as well. And uh, an investigation on Tigers relief pitcher Bruce Rondone getting into a fight on the field in a game. But first off, uh, let's go. To, let's start with the Lions here. Touchdown, Detroit Lions! Unfortunately. Yep. We're also going to talk about, about another football subject during that, too. But let's recap their loss to the Rams at Edward Jones Dome 21 to 14. Uh, their offense was putrid, plus, they. Uh, Got a few calls that went went against them, but but uh, the, but uh, sh- that but that they shouldn't uh, uh, take too seriously. Uh, uh, Todd Gurley uh, was was one of the players to watch, and uh, he he uh, put on a show in that game. And uh, the Rams were able to hold on, and the and the Lions' defense just uh, fell apart. And and uh, the Rams won twenty-one to fourteen. So, Ed, yeah, go ahead. It was a very well. I'm just gonna have to come out and say it. It was a practically dull game, a uh, low-scoring affair between. It wasn't even a shootout. It wasn't even an exciting offensive display. It was a low-scoring, uh, slow burner between two dreadful football teams. Like it was like really. And we want to look about, take about the quality of game that was played. Uh, the, the difference in the score was literally a pick six from Matthew Stafford. Um, I thrown two Tremaine Johnson. Uh, now on that play, it seemed like uh, Johnson. Now don't get me wrong; he made a good eye on the ball. Uh, he was staring down Matthew Stafford the entire time. But then again, that was part of the problem. I understand he had Calvin Johnson on one-on-one coverage, but Matt Stafford had, had, had to, he had to thrown a much better ball than that. One, he kind of underthrew Calvin and didn't throw him over, and he threw him uh, in the middle of traffic of where Johnson was going to, Tremaine Johnson was going to be, and so he. Uh, the cornerback jumped, uh, typed it right, jumped in front of Calvin Johnson, picked that ball off, and with great help of his blockers, was able to return it uh, all the way for for pick six. So when you factor that in, and the fact that Todd Gurley, the running back out of Georgia, um, some thought he, he was a uh, potential top five or top three draft pick, top ten, whatever the case may be, um, but he, is, he had some injury troubles during his senior season playing with the Bulldogs. Um, it ruined his Heisman helps, and it uh, pushed him back uh, further than he wanted to go in the draft. But you can see uh, the potential is there considering the type, the type of game he had for St. Louis. 140 yards on the ground. He had 140 up there, 200-plus rushing yards, 
over on the game, as well as their two other touchdowns. Um, he did a great job just gashing the Lions defense all day. Whether it like, doesn't matter if they put eight or nine guys in the box, even uh, Gurley will still find holes. He will still find grass. He will still find running room, and he would use his speed and uh, awareness and field vision to get the best out of what was there on that play. Like an example on the second touchdown run. Um, he was able to use great movement and footwork uh, to cut from the left to the right and just use his speed to race over to the edge and get that pile on for the score. So that was an example of what Todd Gurley can bring uh, on any given day, on any given Sunday. So the Rams were very, very fortunate to have been in the position to draft him when they did. Um, they're going to need a quarterback, though, since they already they gave up on the Sam Bradford experience. So now, I guess, what, um, they're dealing with Case Keenum. Uh, good luck with that until you can find yourself a real quarterback. But, you know, if they're going to get wins to, for the rest of the season, they're going to rely heavily on Ty, Todd Gurley. Uh, we'll see how much that the young man can can, can hold, uh, can take, rather, uh, since he's going to be pretty much the focal point of this whole entire offense for the last few weeks of the season. Um, another example, though, also of where we didn't hear Haloti Nas' name that much, if at all. Like, this is a guy that was supposed to be brought in, uh, at the very least, if not a replacement as of Indiana Gitsu, but in the words of, uh, of a newspaper article, a compatible Sue replacement. That wasn't even the case here. Like, I thought not especially was to stop the run. Where was that on Sunday when Gurley was running up and down all the and through and over, literally over the Detroit Lions defense, where was uh, Nada there? You know, Ziggy Ansah can't do it all by himself. His specialty really is, is is rushing the quarterback, not stopping the run. So this is where you need, you know, big defensive tackles to uh, win the battle in the trenches up front, get in the backfield, and really disrupt some plays, whether it be offensively or when the quarterback drops back the pass. So, where was Nada's name? Again, a non-factor. He's been uh, very disappointing as a signing this year. Um, the rest of the defense, what else I could say? You know, they, they did a good job of not letting Case Keenum beat him. But, like like I said, they just couldn't. They just did not have an answer for Todd Gurley. Like, really, Gurley was the player, was the biggest difference. Uh, he was the X factor. He was the playmaker, whatever you want to call it. He was the reason why St. Louis won this game today. Uh, or one it's Sunday, wherever the case may be. Um, so props to him. You hope he stays healthy enough where he can have a, a good, long, um, produ- productive career. But um, back now to the Lions, like, where do you go from here? It seemed like a part of them also, though, like, like they didn't want to be there because maybe, and I'm not trying to use this as an excuse, they're probably still shell-shocked from what happened to them over a week ago against Green Bay. So you never know, because, you know, this game is part mental as it is physical. So, you know, maybe some of the players, their mind just wasn't into it because they couldn't quite get over the shock of what happened. I know it's over a week. I know some will say, they'll deny it and say, no, no, it's not time to pass over. But when like, something like that happens, when you were so assured of victory, and then literally at a snap of a finger, in the moment's notice, it's not, and now you have a crushing, back-breaking, heartbreaking, soul-crushing loss, when that happens to you, like, I don't know how much that takes you out of, takes the will out of you in terms of trying to get up and get ready for the next game, because it's just not that simple. So that was an element that you had to pay attention to also. Um, and so now we're, here we are, the Lions only have a few games left in the season anyway, you know, you got four wins. You know, one of those you probably shouldn't have won anyway, maybe, or two, really, if you count the first Green Bay game and the first game against the Bears. So, um, at this point, you know, you already fired your president. You already fired your GM. Um, you would hope the best-case scenario, if you want to think about long-term productivity for this team, this franchise, this organization, you've got to fire Jim Caldwell. And the only way to practically guarantee that you have got to lose as many games left on your schedule as possible. Okay, they already, you know, this is a game we actually picked them, to, I picked them to win, and and listen, I'm very glad and happy that they, they proved me wrong in that case, so now you guys keep the, keep the ball rolling. You're going, I believe the next game is at St. Louis. Yeah, I believe it is. It's, the, it's at St. Louis. 
I was not at San Luis, excuse me, at uh, New Orleans. Uh, this will be the Monday nighter on the next Monday night in New Orleans against the, against the Saints. Um, the last two times they've been there, they have not, it has not gone well for them. That their defense has been shredded both times. I believe they gave up 40 points both time, uh, in both those occasions. One in the regular season, the other in the wild card playoff um, in 2012. So, especially now that you don't have Indominus Sue there anymore, uh, and knowing how New Orleans performs at home, this will again. This is another game you would expect the Lions. Hey, this is a good chance you could lose. So, and after that, you're looking at uh, four and ten going into the last two games. Now, granted, these last two games are critical because if you win both, you you knock yourself out of any ch- any hope or shot of grabbing the top ten overall selection. Because really, that's, I think that should be the Lions' uh, highest ceiling now at this point. If you lose both, now your your top ten status is practically guaranteed. But if you win one, iffy, and if you win two, it's it's definitely shot at the moment. But they got a chance to win these two games because, quite frankly, the 49ers have been terrible, and the Bears, well, they're just the Bears at this point, you know. Uh, they, they're continuing their bad stretch, so to speak, from games last year into this year, and they were nowhere near uh, a, a, a player in terms of trying to get a, a final wild card spot. So um, yeah, things could still happen, but uh, I think we can just say, thank goodness, this season is almost over. It's kind of like what, what we did when we were talking about with the Tigers. Just thank goodness, the season is almost over. It's the same thing now with the Lions. Only in this case, you hope to do the right thing and fire their horrible, awful, bad coach. You mentioned uh, the Lions not using Haloti Nada enough times on defense. That's no, just no, no, another. Just, yeah, I thought it was not a really not getting his name called because he wasn't doing anything. But if it's that's also play calling, shame on them also because like. Well, that, that's what reason. I was trying to point out. That's what I was trying to point oh, okay. out. Yeah. 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 Both of those. Both of those things are uh, are both examples of ineptitude of the Lions coaching staff, especially Jim Caldwell, who uh, should probably be fired and and could be as well. What do you think? He should be. He should be dead man walking. Like, you know, as much as they try to give him a hope spot with a three-game winning streak, when you start out 1-7 and seven and you get embarrassed in the ways that the Lions got embarrassed, not to mention the fact that, like I said before, the, the president and the GM got axed, okay? When that happens, usually they had the coaches next to follow suit. And I'm of the belief that no matter what happens, especially now this, that they're out of the playoff race, playoff, playoff contention, um, the Lions should have uh, no trouble or, or take no issue in terms of terminating Jim Caldwell of his duties. Uh, I would do it like the, the moment... Uh, that's how cruel I am. I, I would I would fire him the moment that the final game w- was over. Like I would even wait till the get to the locker room. I'd let him know right there in the sideline. Listen, no matter what happens today, you just coach your final game as a member of the Detroit Lions. You know, uh, I would just tell you now instead of just leave you in limbo and and we're fretting about what the hell's gonna happen. But I would just let you know right here and now. Yeah, you know, thanks for getting us playoffs last year, but unfortunately, we just got to move in a separate direction. Best of luck in your future endeavors. Yeah, that's why. Uh, this is why uh, you're my number one co-host. You have every right to be cruel to the to the Lions franchise, especially the the head coach Jim Caldwell, who was. Because they've uh, been cruel to us. They've yeah. Been cruel to us. To me, to you, to every fan of this godforsaken exactly. team for how many long now? Oh man, fifty eight years. Soon to be fifty nine. Yes, and that's all. And that's uh, mostly on the Fords, if not all on the Fords. They they ought to sell this franchise. Seriously, the the Fords care more about the Ford Motor Company than they care about football, especially in Detroit. And that's fine. If that's the case, fine. Then get the team to someone else. Someone who would care about uh, producing uh, an engaging and productive uh, product, not just off the field, but especially on the field also. Exactly. And, and, and an owner who knows how to win 
Super Bowl championships, for goodness sakes. Just win, win anything. How about that? Well, don't just win anything. Win it all. You get, That's the objective. Now, um, we, we ran into it. I ran into an article uh, from uh, the Detroit Free Press, uh, Dave Burkett. Found that from Bleacher Report, headlining Lions Notes, Ebron rips officials after late after latest bad call. You're just a crybaby, a coward. Now, um, now, admittedly, the Lions were on the wrong end of a, another blown officiating call in that loss. The officials called uh, Theo Riddick for a chop block penalty late in the first half to nullify a 36-yard pass to Golden Tate that would have given the Lions a first down at the Rams' 8-yard line and a great scoring opportunity. That penalty cost the Lions 51 yards in field position. The ball was spotted at the Lions' 41 after the penalty, and the Lions punted four plays later and went in the locker room trailing 7-0 at halftime. And the Lions just... Uh, that the Lions had had a chance, still had a chance, a, a smaller chance, but they still had a chance to uh, get at least three points on on the board, and uh, they they uh, didn't give they uh, didn't give much ever. They were way too down, brought down by that penalty. They could not overcome adversity, especially Eric Ebron, who said. Uh, Quote, when you play here for the Lions, it's always more than 11 on 11. The term Detroit versus everybody didn't come out for no reason. That's how it is. It's us against the world, and we've got to play like it every game. This is getting old. You're just a crazy okay, so, a coward. Like, Eric, I appreciate you trying to pander and get on the fans' good side, but guess what? You're not exactly their favorite player right now if you keep dropping passes and dropping passes and dropping passes. Good 10th overall selection, by the way. Yeah, and this whole Detroit versus everybody thing. Okay, you were in North. You played in North Carolina. You only been here for a couple of years. I don't know if you're exactly <laughs> the right person to uh, spout off that mantra. Certain instances, okay, that the whole mantra would be fine. But like in every bad situation, not everybody is out to get the city of Detroit or its sports teams. Admittedly, it was a bad call. Yes, but that was not the reason why. At the end of the day, that was not the reason, the sole defining reason why the Lions lost that game. They lost that game because they couldn't stop Tom Gurley from running over their asses. That's why they lost that game. Exactly. And and uh, Eric Ebron... Blame yourselves. Yeah. Not the refs. Yeah, blame it on the franchise that, that's been uh, awful for 58 years. Don't be such a crybaby coward. You're just a crybaby, a coward! Man... <laughs> That that's another thing that's just hilarious about this franchise. Victim, <laughs> it seems that, that it seems that way to me at least. Instead of just admitting your own uh, shortcomings, your own faults, your own screw ups. Yep. Like for God's sakes, even Matt, even Matt Millen himself apologized for his run uh, as Lions GM. So if, if he can do that, Ta-da. what's the Ford's excuse? What's the Ford's excuse? None. None. Yeah, and uh, the the Fords keep saying they'll never give up, but uh, they don't have the brains for it. They don't have okay, the. Okay, this isn't right. They, they don't. Right, this is not wrestling. This is not WWE. You are not John Cena. You can't just say that and then poof, it'll happen. Like no. This takes time, this takes effort, and quite frankly, I don't know how much time you have left, because we don't know how much longer Martha Ford is going to live, okay? Let's just be honest. She's she might die soon. She's a 90-year-old widow. She's a 90-year-old widow, okay? She, she might die soon. Hey, I hate to sound morbid, but that's life. That's what happens sometimes, especially with old people running teams. Yeah, old people that are at least 90, maybe over 100, can, can die of old age. Like... Right, just natural causes or something like that. So you really can't live forever. Have, uh, right, you gotta have some type of plan in motion. They, they, you, you would hope that the the, the the four children, or at least the daughters. I don't know about Bill Junior since they 
want to keep him shut out. Even uh, he would. Of, even he would care more about the Ford Motor Company than this team. Right. So, like, even still, like when that day comes, that Martha's time on this earth is no more. What would be the plan? Would it be then finally to sell the team, or they want to keep it within house even more and let the the children bicker and squabble over it and dragging this team and this franchise and this organization further down more into purgatory for the next oh I don't know thirty years? No, just sell the team to someone who you know is going to be capable enough for it, make a billion bucks or so off of it, and then you know be on your merry way to heaven. I I guess I guess see, unless you're still going to live for another 20, 20 or thirty years. So uh, touching more on football, uh, the Lions were the Lions were off to a great start. Owen 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 five. They we were get we were just about to get that. Uh, we were just about. We were just getting that hashtag streaky for Kimdichi uh, campaign going, and then they, and then we win against the Bears in overtime. Then they, then we lose two, two more in a row, before beating the Packers at Lambeau Field for the first time since '91. Then, winning two more, two more, uh, two more, and and winning three straight before. Uh, which pretty much puts a dent in uh, getting getting their ch- uh, uh, in their chance. Pretty much destroys their chances at getting any top draft pick. And then and then they lose to Green Bay in a devastating way, in a self destructive way. And and they uh, they shut themselves pretty much shut themselves out in St. Louis. Uh, first they. First they uh, d- destroyed their chances of getting Robert Kandichi, and now they missed the playoffs. But let's talk about Robert Kandichi. He was, uh, in, in sources show that uh, he was, uh, he fell on, on a fourth floor after uh, using marijuana. He was being hospitalized, and now, to earlier Tuesday, uh, earlier Monday rather, earlier Monday. Uh, at about noon or eleven, uh, uh, afternoon rather, close to one p.m., uh, Kendichi gets charged with possession of marijuana. Rightfully so, as, as much as I hate, as much as we hate to admit that. <laughs> but but uh, that, but on both sides of that of this situation, it totally fell apart. Yeah, the law is the law, and you must abide by it. No matter how you may think of a certain rule of a certain law, it's there for a reason at the end of the day until it's changed. So you had to abide by it. So that's on him. He brought that upon himself. You know, he knew what he was dealing with. He knew what he had on his on his on his on his person at the time, and he got caught for it. So he's going to have to deal with, with whatever consequences and whatever fallout takes place. Um, I think it suffice it to say that, that we kind of picked the right moment to declare the streaky for Kim, Kim Tichy camp ain't dead right after the Lions blew out the, the Eagles on Thanksgiving. But then again, now with this latest turn of events, it may be alive now more than ever when you think about it in a convoluted sort of way. Because I think you would have to assume that Kim Tichy's draft stock is going to fall, correct? Oh, uh, Kim, Kim Tichy himself, you say? Yeah, I would say so. The, 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 the talent will still be there. You're still going to have some teams that are going to do whatever, will want to try to select them. But now I've been hearing about this, then some may take the high and mighty approach and go, oh, I don't know, this may not be the guy we want. And then they'll be looking at a lot towards, like, say, a, a Joey Bosa, for instance, from Ohio State, who was seen as another uh, possible top five or top three selection. And that was before... He almost murdered Jake Rudock uh, in Ann Arbor against Michigan. So, Shelly Bosa will be will go in the top three, maybe go at number one, unless uh, Derrick Henry uh, gives him a runner for his morning, the running back out of Alabama. So, when those you know when you see those guys go at the top, 
now it leaves Kimbiji some time to, to fall back a little bit. And especially now here after this latest news, he could, you know, see some stock, this stock fall. Just a little, hopefully it's not too much where, you know, he gets, he goes out the first round, loses some, and loses out on guaranteed money. But still, he should, he should fall some spots to where a team that, that might not have been in the right spot to get him before might now be in an advantageous position to select him, i.e. the Lions, the way they kept screwing up their chances to, to assure themselves a good draft uh, order order in the draft. Now, with this latest news, if he falls at just the right uh, the, the right amount of spots and the Lions just have to be right there at a certain uh, selection number, you know, why not take a chance on it? Because guess what? You know, when you, you didn't lose just in Dominican suit. You lost him and Nick Fairley. So, really, the only competent guy, you know, Ziggy Hansa, he's been your very, your only, has had a revelation year as well. So, you know, you, you try, if you're trying to rebuild your defensive line back into a strength again, then you would, then I would, that would that's how I would use my first round selection in this upcoming draft. You know, since Joey Bosa will most certainly not be there by the time the Lions pick up, uh, pick. If Kamdiji is still there, I I would take a chance on him. I would. Oh, that, that, is, a, that is a good point. Be the coaching staff by then. Two, um, will they want to? Like, uh, and that's another thing. It depends on the coaching staff is there. Will they be more ambitious or will they be too cautious to say, no, well, we're going to stay away from that. Or, But then again, it could come out to bite you in the ass. See, uh, Picking Eric Ebron over Aaron Donald, a guy you really, really could use right now in light of the uh, of Indomitian Sue walking away for more money in, in Miami. So um, it's an interesting scenario that the, that that could play out more in the next few upcoming months. Um, and like I said, the law is the law. Uh, Kim DG only has himself to blame for it, and he just has to deal with it. That's all. You hope he doesn't get in too much trouble. Because if he can get something into, into uh, some trouble with something as silly as this, uh, hopefully it, it just stops right there and doesn't lead to anything more serious. Yeah, I have to agree. It's just unfortunate. But, um, but uh, fortunate for the Lions to... Uh, see him drop in the draft because they they want a fortunate for us to to have the lions see him drop into a lower spot in the draft cuz uh, they still might use him so with all football out of the way let's go to hockey <laughs> Wings uh, are on a two-game losing streak now. They lost to, to the Devils in overtime, three to two, after blowing a lead late in the third period again. And then they lose uh, two to one in regulation after giving up two goals late in the third period, ending snapping their 13-game point point streak. Let me tell you why. Their offense stinks, and their and the defense and goaltending keep blowing leads late in the third period. And uh, it finally cost them a po- cost them two points, not just one, two. Yep, uh, you 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 had done you had, they had just done so well in terms of getting within striking distance of, of Montreal um, in the Atlantic Division of the Eastern Conference. Now with this latest strain, that now you you come to a point where you don't get any points for this game tonight, and once again it comes boils down to your biggest your biggest weakness not being able to close out a game. I believe I saw a tweet earlier. This was retweeted by Jeff Moss. You can follow him at Jeff Moss DSR. So through, through, you know, go through his timeline. Uh, you know, try not to be too shocked, so to speak, by some of the uh, objective matter object you know, matter that's in there. But back on top of it, he, uh, he retweeted a tweet that mentioned that talked about this, this very issue that's plaguing the wings. And I, when I say plague, it is a black plague. Um, 
of all the goals, uh, of the goals that the Red Wings have given up in the third period, all of them have come out even strength, which is another thing. It's not just power play that that's killing. Or, or you know, they're not at a man uh, disadvantage here. This is all five on five, so that's another issue, another defensive issue as to why you're having trouble keeping one or even two goal leads in the third period. Um, they've given up eleven goals, eleven. In terms of trying to, in fact, I just find that tweet right now. Just give me one second. But uh, what, it, what, it, what it speaks to is to how inept um, they are in terms of trying to close things out or keep a, a lead in the third period. Like, they're one of the worst, if not the worst, defensive or otherwise third uh, period teams in the whole league. Um, here's the tweet that they retweeted. When leading by one in the third period, all strengths, the Red Wings have given up 11 goals worst and are minus eight in goal differential, also worst. Okay? That yep. tweet was from... Prashant that was a tweet. Iyer. Prashant Iyer yep. of Winging It in Motown. Yep. And He's you can a... follow him on Twitter at, at Iyer, I-Y-E-R underscore Prashant, P-R-A-S-H-A-N-T-H. So he brought up a great point, and something that we, like I said, me and you, we have talked about ad nauseum. This team is completely horrible, and I do mean horrible, at closing the deal. Extremely it's like the horrible. Bullpen. It's like the Tigers bullpen. Like, you know The old gonna Tigers happen. bullpen. You know they're going to give up a lead. All right, the current, whatever the case may be, this Tigers bullpen, period. You know they're going to give up a lead. You know they're going to do something stupid. Leave a guy open. That used not, to be current. Not give good protection to your goaltender. Right. Not give your goaltender good protection. And they're going to give up the lead, and then they'll lose and have a regulation or overtime. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's at the point where, like, you just, you know, you, you, you heave your head. You, you, don't, you don't heave your head. You just look at it. You, you take a deep breath. You sigh. And then it's like, well, let's see what, what they can do. For, for this one, can they pull it off, or would they just lose that on two points? And tonight, they lost that on two. Man, th- that that that's that's the worst case scenario scenario right there. That's a point where the Wings have to learn the lesson the hard way, and start winning the third period, and not and not give up uh, uh, the tying goal at all. You, you got to pull away somehow. <sighs> Is, is extremely troubling. Not just the fact that it's minus eight, but they're also the fact that it's the worst of all... Well, how many teams are in the NHL? 30, 31, 32? 30. Whatever the case may be. It's, you know, all... Every single team in the NHL, you are the absolute worst in terms of third period goal differential? Holy crap! That is an embarrassment for a winning... for what used to be a winning NHL franchise in terms of Stanley Cups when they won it in 97, 98, 02, and 08 in the last uh, two decades or so before uh, before their 09 loss at home in a cup final in Game 7 to the Penguins. Uh, the 97 one was the first cup they won since 52. Uh, 55, rather. 55. Uh, then it was 97. That's 42. Uh, yeah, but uh, it's it, it's getting way worse than the Bab- Babcock years. It, and and it's but but uh, I'm I am not I'm not wanting Babcock back. Trust, no, no, don't get me it's wrong. Not, it's not it's not Defcon level that that type of bad, but something must be done. Like we know, defense has been a problem. It's worse, so to speak, of the team for for years, for for several years now. Whether it be not having the right defensemen, or just having the players not executing the right things, the right plays, the right schemes, uh, the right fundamentals on it's the both. ice at given at opportune moments. But now this is like this is ridiculous. Like like really, you know, like it's it's like a running game. Like if this was a drinking game between you and me, we'd be half black, uh, black blacked out drunk right now because like oh the Red Wings have a never goal. I remember, I don't drink. Yeah, but if you were, oh crap, we'd be screwed right now. I know it's uh, 
Yeah, it's the Red it's Wings like that are playing the drinking game. Gag. Yeah. It's a running gag. Like, it's like, will they get, like, wow, how bad are they going to screw up at the third period this time? How many goals will they give in the third period this time? Who's not going to block a shot this time? It's redundant. Yeah, it, it's, it, yeah. Now, now the last two games, when they gave up a tying goal, nobody was in front of the damn goaltender! <laughs> That's the way I saw it! Nobody, absolutely nobody on this team was was in front of the goaltender, whether it be Howard or Morazic. Peter Morazic has been bailing your sorry behinds out for most of the season, and you're not giving him the proper protection. What the hell, man? That's stupid. Are these defensemen like like tone deaf or half deaf or whatever? Oh my god. Chickens. Oh man, they don't want to take anything for the team. What a disgrace. Uh, the Red Wings have off until Friday when they host the Vancouver Canucks. Uh, Can- Canucks are. Another uh, top team in the Western Conference, as, as I may look at it. But, um, look at the standings here. Ah, yes. Conference standings. Going to NHL.com and looking at them. Uh, no, I, I was wrong. The, the Canucks are in 10th place in the Western Conference. Uh, tied tied it in a three way tie for eighth place. Wait, make it a a four way tie for seventh. Um, with the Winnipeg Jets, Arizona Coyotes, and Edmonton Oilers. Whoa, where do those Oilers come from? <laughs> Canucks uh, have thirty points, as do the Oilers, Coyotes, and Jets. The J- the Jets and Coyotes have fourteen, four, are fourteen, at, are both fourteen, fourteen and two. The Oilers are fourteen, fifteen and two, and the Canucks are eleven and eleven, twelve and eight. That's uh, eight overtime losses. Uh, the Wings are now sixteen, nine and six. Uh, but by the way, that uh, third period collapsing can also be on the co- coaching. Yeah, we already mentioned that. Whether the right schemes, yeah. But let but uh, the Canucks uh, are the Red Wings' next opponent. Um, a, another team that the Red Wings had better not lose to. The Sabers are in thirteen are still in thirteenth place in the Eastern Conference with twenty nine points at thirteen, fifteen, and three. That's a team the Red Wings should have clobbered like five nothing. They should have handled. They should have handled them by at least two goals. The line in Vegas was the red was Detroit minus one and a half. All those saying that that the Wings just had another rough night can kiss our asses. Enough already. This has been right. This has been commonplace. Okay. Yes, exactly. It's been going on for almost two months now. It's almost. It's already been a full month, and we're, and we're already in the second month of this. I know some people are going to say you, of this you know, you span. Guys just overreacted. Like, well, no, 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 no. Far from it. Listen, I appreciate the fact that they're they're in a stacked division within their conference, and they're within striking distance of a great team right now, in Montreal. But here's the thing: these little things, these things may compare as little to you, but if you want to win a Stanley Cup this year or within any other given year, you've got to the crack down and perform simply better at the most crucial of elements, i.e., nailing the game down and closing it shut in the third period. When you have the worst third period goal differential in the NHL, that is not nailing it down. That is worse. You're giving it away. Yeah, whether it be in overtime or regulation, it's it's just embarrassing for the Detroit Red Wings. The Detroit Red Wings, who have won 11 Stanley Cups. This isn't the Florida Panthers, 
Raiders we're talking about here, okay? Or the Phoenix Coyotes. This Arizona is, Coyotes. Arizona, thank you. Okay, this is this is equivalent. They are the equivalent to the New York Yankees of in terms of American hockey. This whole sport in this country, they are the team that you used to, to strive towards. Is hey, at least in the states, at least hey, that's our that's the level we want to get at. You know, exactly. Look at the playoff streak. Look at the cups. Look at the banners. Yeah, and and uh, the way the Wings are uh, blowing leads late in the third period is disgracing these banners. So uh, th- that's just, those are all those are pretty much all the ways we can break all this down in terms of hockey. Now we go to the Pistons uh, blowing one in regulation. Left side line three and he answers. They just about had the win sealed, but they uh, they went ahead and let the Clippers tie it in regulation, and then they miss one at at the buzzer to allow overtime to take place. And then they take the lead again, a short overtime lead this time, and uh, they let the Clippers hang around again, and the Clippers, oh. and, and and they let the Clippers run away with it. Jamal friggin' Crawford and J.J. Dan Riddick. Uh, the, the hits keep on coming tonight on this show, huh? First the Lions, then the Red Wings, now the Pistons. It's like everybody wants to piss us off tonight. Well, good job, Mission accomplished. <laughs> oh, man, this is all Detroit versus Detroit, for Christ's sake. Right, Pardon this is Detroit versus everybody. This is Detroit versus itself. Yes. <laughs> oh, Let's my God. Mirror. Yeah, right now, all three freaking teams are embarrassing right now. Not only the Lions, but the Red Wings, Jeff Blaschel equaling the Brad Osmus. And and the Pistons, who are still trying harder to make a make a playoff run. Oh man! The Pistons were the, the, the team that they were sec- there was the Pistons were seconds away from gaining, in my view, a big win. Because listen, this is the last time they faced the Clippers. They didn't have either JJ Redick or Chris Paul. They still got smoked. Okay, so this time around things were different. They had those players. You know, Blake Griffin went off fine, but DeAndre Jordan didn't kill you, nor did Chris Paul. You know, Andre Drummond got his usual 20 points, 15 rebounds, okay, good for him. Reggie Jackson was tremendous. Another 30 points, 30 plus points, another 10 plus uh, rebounds, almost messed around, had a triple double. He was a, he was a few assists shy of the triple double. So the issue wasn't Reggie Jackson, the issue wasn't the offense, it was the defense. It kind of mirrors what we've been talking about with the Red Wings in terms of closing the deal. The Pistons now, for what the second straight time on their home floor, they let one get away from them. Yeah, because they they couldn't defend the arc. They they go back to having this issue of uh, leaving wide open threes, it, uh, uh, getting hit. They they keep allowing wide open threes. That's been the issue. That's what that's what I pointed out for months. And it's embarrassing. It's, it's, yeah, you you got to know, especially if you're if you're up three late in the game and you know they have a three-point shooter in J.J. Redick, it is imperative that you defend him as well as you possibly can. If he throws off a crazy-ass shot and it goes in, bully for him, you know, props to him. But no, he did a pump fake, got dribble, and created a high-level shot for him. He's going to sink that night. Nine, out of ten, nine times out of ten. You know how many times they had to witness him do that when he was playing for Duke? Okay, that's natural to him. Yeah, and, and uh, he's he's pretty good. He's no joke. Right, say what you want, but he does what his role requires him to do. That's right. And in the end of that, that overtime period, the... Uh, they miss a free throw, and uh, Drummond had a chance to uh, tie it with with an easy putback, and he missed miserably with it. They and they keep mis- miserably missing easy shots, and then uh, oh man, they miss all the shots, and 
and they pay for it and lose in overtime, 105-103. It's just, my God, embarrassing. It would have been a great win to have on your resume, um, a good confidence booster, and let's you know, hey, on any given night, we can beat any given team. You've kind of proven it this year when you beat LeBron James and the Cleveland Cavaliers. Um you know, and you beat the the Atlanta Rock and the Atlanta, the Atlanta Hawks and the Miami Heat and the Chicago Bulls. You know, those teams that are seen as potential front runners to come out of the East, uh, represent the East in the finals for this season. So that lets you think, okay, the optimism's there. And once Brandon Jennings is back from injury, we'll see what this team is really made of. But the, this is something they've got to work on. Um, it also doesn't help when guys not named Andre Drummond are missing crucial key free throws. Kadavius Caldwell Pope missed a big one, I believe it was in overtime. Yeah, missed one in overtime. Yep. Uh, you know, um, little things like that, they, they will add up, especially when you have, when you lose by that close a margin. Um, and more players also. The the starting, it was just, it seemed like the only two that were contributing uh, were, or the, for the starters, so to speak, were Drummond and Jackson. Uh, Marcus Morris, where the hell was he tonight? He had an awful night shooting. He didn't get into double digits uh, with his scoring. You really could have used his output like like we were we were seeing at the, at the, at the start of the season, and that could have carried, helped carry us to victory, but that wasn't there. Man. Yeah. So you got this team. They, they need to show some consistency. It can't be this type of pity pat pattern of win one, lose two, win two, lose two, win lose one. You know, go back and forth, back and forth, where you're barely scraping out a, a 40, uh, 42, 43 win season. Like, you know, you got to create some distance, so to speak. If you want people to think, hey, this is something different, you got to win more close tight games. It's easier said than done, sure, but when you have. People like Drummond that has given you double doubles almost with with the utmost ease. Reggie Jackson balling out, you know, and what what you see what Marcus Morris is capable of on any given night. Potentially Brandon Jennings coming back soon. You know, you gotta finish better. It's like what we mentioned with the Red Wings. Close it out. Exactly. We we gotta Yeah, we gotta uh hash create a hashtag campaign, close it out. Close games out in regulation. Do or, or something. Just, no, just 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 follow a hashtag that the Michigan uh, University of Michigan basketball team did. It was when Mitch McGarry he wrote it on a whiteboard and just held it up during the huddle. Hashtag win the game. And that's simple. Win the game just in win regulation. The game. Win, period. Regulation overtime. I don't care. Win the game. Well, 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 we, well, we. Well, we don't want to go into overtime. We want to win in regulation. That's that's our point. True, but sometimes if it comes down to it, fine. But just win the friggin' game. Yeah, our hashtag here will be win the game in regulation because uh, we need to win more games in regulation and not just overtime. I'm a, I am of the fan of the close it down hashtag. So close it down. That, that means that'll work. Yeah, that mean yeah that means you're. You're not letting anything get too out of hand. You're handling your business, and you're shutting down shop for the night, as it should be when it comes to regulation. When they when they shut down shop for the night at, at, at a workplace or whatever, they, you don't see people going into overtime. No, they close it out. That's right. Because that, that's that's always the objective when a team has a lead. So uh, speaking of. Uh, which college basketball we uh, tuned to uh, the Michigan State Spartans uh, just they just barely hang on against the Florida Gators in a 2000 national championship rematch we recall that the Spartans beat Florida for the national championship I don't I don't remember what the final score of that game was like 15 16 15 and a half years ago but uh, in the rematch they won 58 to 52 at Breslin Center uh, and it was a tight game the whole way through. But um, the Spartans, after that win, still remain number one in the country. And they have off until Saturday when they travel to Northeastern. And uh, and we we would bet bet to God that they would w- the Spartans would win that game easily. Oh yeah, uh, it is worth noting that uh, I did mention in the 
last episode that this that was a game to look at in terms of interesting and intriguing non-conference opponents uh, before Big Ten play starts. Because, you know, Florida has a name, recognition. They also had a good record, even though it was, even though they were on the road. You know, I, I expect them to give a good effort, especially since they're playing the known, now known number one team in the nation. So that when you see that score and things, okay, they gave it a good effort. So that'll probably be their, um, even if you count the game the, against Oakland that they usually play at the Palace, I would consider that as their remaining, you know, noteworthy game that they had to get out unscathed in terms of the non-conference schedule before Big Ten play starts. After that, all bets are off. Any given night in that conference, especially when you're on the road, you know that team is going to bring it, especially when they see that number one next to your uh, next to your name saying, okay, this is this is our this is our national championship essentially. We gotta give it everything we got. So so MSU's gotta be prepared, prepared prepared to take every team's best shot uh, come conference play. And I think with it is it will have them well prepared, hopefully at least. Yep. And uh, on the other hand, Michigan basketball, as you meant, as you mentioned, uh, well, Mitch McGarry, but uh, touching on Michigan basketball anyway, they destroyed Delaware State 80 to 33. They play Northern Kentucky tonight, uh, 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 Wednesday or Tuesday rather. Uh, just another easy team that the Wolverines should beat. Yeah, you know, it's it's really it's going to depend on. Um, what can you do now when the going gets tough and you face, uh, I, you don't face the little sisters of the poor and you face regular, uh, good quality, talented teams? Well, we'll see what will happen. They've gotten their asses kicked in, in three, three times this year. You know, all three of their losses have been blowouts. Granted, you face good teams, but still, that's very troubling if you're a team that's trying to, to show and prove that last year was an anomaly in terms of having a bad year. So they, they gotta get the ball rolling that in that regard because once Big Ten, once, once conference play starts in the Big Ten, it's all or nothing. Like I mentioned before with MSU, so it's easy to it, more people have got to step up on offense. It can't just be uh, Karis Levert and the other and the other four. You know, you you want to see what Derek Walton can provide, what Zach Irvin can provide, Duncan Robinson off the bench. You know, that's key because guess what? This isn't a team. They don't have that perennial uh, All-American big, okay? They don't have uh, even a noteworthy presence in the post, so to speak. You know, whether, we, whether it was in years past, Mitch McGarry or even Jordan Morgan. So that's not – that that is no longer here or there. So they got to utilize their strength. And what is their strength? When they're on, it is their outside shooting, the perimeter shooting, whether it be long twos or high or quality threes, they got to utilize it. You know, if granted, it is the you know the saying "live by the three, die by the three, But you know, it, it seems like to be their only option that they have at this point in terms of keeping them close in games. Like when they're on, when their shooting is on point, they can they can have a good night against practically anybody in college basketball. But when it's off, who it shows. You know, so they gotta have more players step up offensively because, quite frankly, because defensively they're not that stout. Where they can hold teams to a certain amount and be able to go on 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 offensive tears. Um, noteworthy news, so to speak. Before we, before we move on to the next topic, it was announced earlier this past week, or maybe in the weekend, that uh, Spike Albrecht has announced that due to him still recovering uh, from hip surgery that he had in the off season in the summer, he will have no choice but not but to um, stop playing. Uh, for the rest of this year, and that effectively, if, if, if more than likely, ends his college career with the Wolverines. You may remember Spike from having the breakout of all breakout games, scoring 17 points uh, in the first half of the national championship game against uh, Louisville in, two, in 2013. Um, and he will, and since then, he made himself very well beloved with fans, uh, with his style of play, his nature, um, his competitive edge, everything. Um, and how he was able in key circumstances and clutch moments where he was able to help the team come up big. So, you you, you know, it's it's a shame that it had to end like this, you know, because I'm sure uh, they will be, they, the Wolverines will be dying for, 
for spikes. Not the usual, but at least some form of production. But if, the, if his body is not working or, be, or in a working cohesively with him, you know, Spike's got to know for the sake of his health long term. When he, like the song says, you got to know when to hold him, when, when to fold him. So, um, a thank you to Spike Albrecht on the job well done, a memorable collegiate career, uh, and forever go blue. So I wish Spike luck, uh, whatever he does next in his life, whether it be grad assistant, whatever the case may be. Um, thank you, Spike, and good luck, and go blue. Yep. That, that's just tragic, because the worst part of it is he could have been NBA-bound. and um... Might have been. Might have been. He would have, they, uh, a team would have found a useful spot for him, you know? Uh, think about Matthew Delavidova. That's, that's what I'll compare Spike Albrecht to, in, in terms of style, play, leaving it out on, on the court, and just find, trying to find... Uh, I wouldn't say lockdown defender, but play some good defense on on, a, on somebody every once in a while. So that's what I would compare uh, would use as a template to compare Spike Albrecht, what he could have been in the NBA. Now at this point, it's it's you don't know how, you don't even know if you'll ever you'll even play overseas or it'll just be a grad assistant, whatever the case may be. So it is sad, but hey, that's life. That's how it works out sometimes. Yep. All right. Uh, enough of the tissues and things. Let let's uh, do do some more investigation. Uh, got got more baseball than just the Tigers, but let's touch on the Tigers first. That one is long gone. Tigers relief pitcher Bruce Rondon got into a fight on the field in a uh, Venezuelan league game. And Ed, I want you to break that down as best you can. Yeah, I'll try. <laughs> I'll do my very best. Um, it's not clearly, not so clear what happened because it is itself, um, like the whole audio is, is it's, it's in the native language. Uh, but Rondo, and I believe he was playing, like you mentioned, in a uh, international, I guess what you say, minor league game, so to speak. And the person that he got into this altercation with was... Um, Jose Osuna, who is a prospect for the Pittsburgh Pirates. Now, if you look by the video, and I will, um, if you can, uh, I'll post a link on, I'll share the link on my Twitter, at EdSmith313, so just be on the lookout for that. Uh, it's a YouTube clip. It's about a minute and a half long, but what it shows, uh, Rondo, Rondo is, 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 is on the mound. Osuna is on first base. He's trying to lead off. You know, he's he's... Uh, inching off, on, you know, trying to see what Rondon's going to do. Will he steal? Will he not? And then Rondon throws back to first. And the way, if you look at it in terms of the context, especially with how Osuna got back to the base, the ball, what it, when, it's, when it's in, thrown back to the first baseman, it's not that far away from hitting Osuna in the head. And now that's for me, that's from my perspective, that's how, um, if you want to quote unquote break it down, so to speak. Uh, that might have been what would have gotten, what would have gotten Osuna a little bit irritated and annoyed and quite frankly uh, pissed off because, hey, you know, the way you threw that ball up was often too close, uh, you know, to hit me in the head. And knowing how serious head injuries and concussions are nowadays in this day and age, you know, that's something you don't F around with, you don't screw around with, you don't play around with whatsoever. So I can understand Osuna's uh, concern in that regard. And, and then, next thing you know, he and Rondon, they start jaw-jacking at each other. And then about a second or two later, Rondon starts walking over, walk, walking over to first base with a purpose. And then they're still talking, they're still talking, they're still talking. Then sooner than you can say, that's fresh, Rondon comes out and, of all things, Listen, I'm a boxing guy, I'm an MMA dude, I'm a combat sports freak. If you look at the video, it looks like Rondo was trying to throw a freaking flying knee at, at Osuna, and he just missed. And then after that, uh, the bench is clear, they have to separate guy, both guys, but not before, and they both get in their shots. It wasn't so many, so much punches as it was arm punch, you know, punch with the hands as it was arm punches and open-handed slaps. Of both guys, you know, they were essentially brawling with each other, and it led to a full uh, Pier 6 uh, breakdown, so to speak. Both benches were emptied. I'm not 
not sure who was ejected, if there was any ejections. But yeah, it was it was kind of crazy. You know, some of the fans they were they were going wild for it themselves. So it was like, hey, you know, we got a uh, an extra show to go with the game. So let's enjoy it for as much as we can. And, and they uh, they obviously did. No one got hurt, thankfully. Um, and it really speaks to you know it could be an issue. It could be not. I think because you know uh, some talk, some Tigers talk has cooled down in recent days and weeks in terms of not landing not landing too much of a big signing since you know what they did with Jordan Zimmerman. You know some people might find maybe pressed to find anything to talk about regarding regarding the team. So when they see this Rondon stuff, up, they're like, oh, there you, there we are. Um, but it could be an issue because there were some things that I've read online, but maybe the Tigers feel that Rondon has some maturity issues, and that could be one thing that's derailing his process and his and his progress, rather, in terms of uh, became, becoming a um, productive person out of the bullpen, because God knows they need any uh, good production from that bullpen at all costs. And when you have one your own internally, and he's not performing well, and if you feel that's a maturity issue, um, that's something to take concern with. And then when you see now, when you see this, it kind of makes you wonder were those rumors and were those reports true? So um, will Rondon face any repercussions for this? We don't know. That should be seen. Um, if there's an update, we'll let you know. But if not, then they'll let you know this really was a non-story to begin with. So. Ron Doan, right now, is throwing a, a, a two-flat whip, a 2.00 walks hits per innings pitch ratio, allowing one run on four hits in four innings in winter ball. Uh, one, run, one run given up uh, in four innings. Uh, it's not too bad, but uh, two, a 2.00 two zero zero whip this That's winter. Troubling. Yeah. That, that is a, the, the whip is That's a, something a, else there. Okay, right. Uh, ha, 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 the whip. But for real, the, the whip stat is, is something I look I look at to as more important than, say, ERAs or wins because that, that's one of, if not the true definition of how much production, uh, what a pitcher brings to the table in terms of uh, getting guys out and not taking too many hit or not uh, – you know, uh, not giving up too many hits and allowing too many men on base. So if you get guy, get as many guys out as possible, you know, throughout, throughout, throughout however many innings you pitch, uh, the whip is a good indicator stat. So when you have a flat two whip, ugh, I feel like doing the nervous uh, uh, collar tug and pull that they did on The Simpsons. Now, ugh, that's, like, that's exactly my reaction when I see that and hear of that. Just, oh, oh God. please, for the love of God, fix that. I know. That is worse than uh, his 2015 season with the Tigers when he posted a 581 ERA and a 161 oh. whip in 31 innings. I, I got that oh. two-flat whip uh, s- stat from uh, WZZM13, a source from that via Anthony, Anthony Fennick at the Detroit Free Press. The Tigers beat writer. I know. He, yeah, he was uh, once convicted of a of a, a DUI and sexual harassment on Facebook in messages, and uh, sometimes he's uh, a little inept with uh, his opinions on how the Tigers are going to do and, and stuff. But uh, he, 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 I, he does have some pros here, and besides all of his cons. He does uh, a good job, not great, but a good job uh, uh, getting uh, uh, retaining sports news. And um, that's about all I can come up with. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a can of worms we would rather have uh, keep buried for, 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 for another time. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And Brad Osmus' uh, reaction here in that source, saying, quote, it's doable, it's definitely doable. If he comes back and you can tell when he goes on the mound, he's focused and wants to succeed, it's definitely doable. It's not like a parrot, but we'll just have to take a wait-and-see at it attitude. That wasn't, that wasn't much focus from what I saw in that clip. That wasn't focused at all. That was that was called letting your 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 
emotions get the best of you. Does if, not focus at all. If you combine the two flat whip and that fight, it it it, it becomes a, a natural a natural total disaster in run inside Rondone totally. Just 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 like zero chances of coming back to the majors. Or or let or very little if not zero. But uh, with all that out of the way, uh, uh, what it, what was your take on uh, MLB Commissioner Rob Manfred uh, not reinstating Pete Rose in, in, uh, and allowing him to and to get in the Hall of Fame? Still for betting on baseball because uh, Pete Rose told told him he still bets on baseball. That that's just uh, rare that Pete Rose still bets on baseball after admitting. I think what it was, what it was, it was discovered that you know originally, first of all, first, Pete Rose did not, you know way back when denied he did any type of betting on baseball whatsoever. Then of course in 2004 when he had a book about to come out, you know, My Prison Behind Bars, that was the name of his, of his book, that's when he finally admitted uh, to a, on ABC in an exclusive interview, I think it was with Charlie Gibson, uh, that he said, yes, it, I did bet on baseball, it was a horrible mistake, you know, but, I, but I'm completely sorry for that. Some see it as, okay, that was his his, pathetic, his, his own attempt to try to, to nagle his way into getting the band lifted so he can go into Hall of Fame, because quite frankly, you know, it's kind of it's kind of weird to see a sport that you know when you have a, an all-time hits leader, you know, and Pete and Pete an all-time leader in a category as Pete Rose is not in the Hall of Fame. That's weird. But the the sin that he committed it was it's it seemed to, to those to those as so egregious they had no choice but to suffer the ultimate punishment. Now I think uh, Rob Manfred might have considered lifting the ban if it wasn't found out in recent months that Rose did in fact bet on his own team. That was another thing that Rose had flat out denied that not only did he not bet on baseball, he had never bet on his own team. So, uh, uh, that might have been the Reds then when he was as a player and as the manager. So, that's another aspect when you think about it. When you keep trying wanting to give him a chance to chance to chance and it turns out he's just lying and it's lie after lie after lie. Why would you want to reward him essentially by lifting this ban? So it was a tough stance. It might, might have been an unpopular one, but I think Rob Manfred felt he had no other choice, and I, I I agree with the decision. Yep, I agree with the decision too. I just think it's fair. Um, and speaking of which, uh, Ryan Schuling. Our good friend Ryan Schuling, the host of the Schuling Report on the Team 92 on FM in Lansing, WQTX FM, posted an article from, posted a source, uh, an article from Awful Announcing that, that, uh, that headline, MLB players cannot play but still may endorse daily fantasy games. He he added some content. So to be clear, MLB Commissioner Rob Manfred totally cool with partial ownership interest in DraftKings and players endorsing a daily fantasy sports betting error gambling error game of skill site. Not okay with Pete Rose betting on baseball. Got it. Yeah. Makes total sense. Yeah, I get now. now that is where okay, you got to put your money where your mouth is. Uh, pardon the analogy here, but you know you just, that's. That's going to make you look like too much of a hypocrite. And you just got the job, okay? So don't don't turn yourself into another Roger Goodell or Bud Seelig or, or Gary Bettman. Give yourself a, a chance to get over here with, with the crowd here before you, you start doing dumb stuff like this. Like, well, it's essentially, you know, you're, you're doing, that's what the definition of a hypocrite is. You're doing one thing, say one thing, yet you do another. So, yeah, very weird. And kind of funny when you, if you look at it in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, the source was uh, published by Ian Castleberry. Um, he, he writes uh, in the second paragraph, as reported by ESPN's Dar Darren Rovell, MLB and the Players Union have reached an agreement that prohibits the league's plant 
league's players from participating in daily fantasy games, yet still allows them to endorse companies as pitchmen. Since MLB has an ownership stake in DraftKings, this agreement might raise an eyebrow or two. How can the league, how can the league partner up, pardon me, with a daily fantasy site, yet not let its players participate in those games? In the third paragraph, the issue is a conflict of interest over prizes available in daily fantasy games. If an MLB player stood to win some money in a fantasy game, wouldn't it call into question whether or not he was doing something into, to influence, perhaps adversely, the outcome of a ball game? Obviously, this is why baseball has had such a strict policy d- toward gambling since 1927. But daily fantasy games aren't gambling, in the view of MLB Commissioner Rob Manfred. Actually, that's also the view of federal law. Daily fantasy games are legal, while sports betting isn't, except in the state of Nevada. However, for a commissioner also concerned with keeping young people interested in baseball, you can see the appeal. One of the reasons the NFL is so popular is because fantasy football makes fans invested in the performance of players and compels them to follow the sport closely. Daily fantasy games, whose player dis- whose players tend to skew younger, can, can stoke a similar level of interest for MLB, which needs that level of engagement. This is also presumably one reason why Manfred is open to supporting legalized sports gambling, a position NBA Commissioner Adam Silver has already taken. While it's not official, while, while it's not while it's not yet official, MLB also intends to implement a similar policy for all of its non-player personnel, including the coaches and trainers. How far that extends isn't yet known, but it's safe to pres- it's safe to presume that if you work in an MLB front office, for example, a GM or a vice president or whatever, you won't be allowed to play daily fantasy baseball for money either. It should be pointed out that players and non-player personnel are free to play fantasy baseball that doesn't inv- involve cash prizes. So go ahead and in- invite Nick Swisher or AJ Preller to play in your league. If he plays fantasy baseball as he does the real thing, however, Padres general manager Preller is probably going to crush the competition. Correction. A previous edit of this article incorrectly stated that MLB had a reported 20% ownership stake in DraftKings. That figure actually applies to ESPN. That's the end of that. Yeah, the first paragraph said, remember those old hair club for men commercials when Cy Sperling would endorse his product by saying, quote, I'm not the only hair club president, I'm not the only hair club president, but I'm also a client, unquote. Major League Baseball players won't be able to make a similar claim when, endorse, when endorsing daily fantasy baseball, baseball games like DraftKings and FanDuel. So, um, yeah, if you look at that from uh, awfulannouncing.com, I just posted it on my timeline on Facebook. Uh, you can follow also follow me on Twitter at DT2Phillips. I, tw- I also uh, tweet out the source of the uh, Rondon fight. T- watch Tigers Rondon involved in ugly brawl on freep.com slash 1YDF Wyatt. L Y via via at WZZM thirteen in Grand Rapids, but uh, the, the awful announcing link on ML, MLB players not playing but endorsing daily fantasy games. I just post posted that that on Facebook, but uh, Ed, I, I I have to say you would agree with all with all this. Yeah, it's. It's quite it's, it's an intriguing uh, viewpoint to look at. Like you're, you want to be against. Uh, like I mentioned, it's it's do one say one thing, do another. That's what it all all boils down to. Um, hopefully, them will be. They they hope they find they hope they find a better way, to, a good way to save face out of it. That's all I can add. Yep, and uh, that pretty much covers everything now. Yeah, I guess if you want to do a, a, a post 
script, so to speak, you know, I could give a brief mention of, I think, what, what the whole sports world knows now, that uh, the UFC has a new superstar, officially, and his name is Conor McGregor. He submitted his status, so to speak, by knocking out Jose Otto in 13 seconds of the very first round with one punch. <laughs> He's good. Event, in the main event of this past Saturday night's UFC 194 pay-per-view. So, congrats to McGregor. Um, it's exactly how he predicted it, how he called it. He is Mystic Matt because he's he predicts these things, as he said. So, congrats to him. Heart goes out to Aldo because I'm sure for the champion as long as he was, it was a crushing way to lose your title. But, you know, the UFC, they needed this because after seeing Ronda Rousey get dismantled the way she had the month before, the UFC needed a new bankable star. Now you have one in Conor McGregor. So you see, we'll see what they can do from him going moving forward, whether or not he stays at 145 in the featherweight division or moves up to 155 to challenge for the lightweight title. We, we will just have to wait and see. Yeah, we'll have to wait and see who he knocks out next in UFC 175. Well, Ed, that was such a flame-throwing episode of the Detroit Sports Truth. That made us both feel very good after what we witnessed, after all that we witnessed earlier tonight. It was cathartic, I'll just say that, and the flames have now been put out, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and uh, probably more flames, uh, more flame-throwing to come in episode 180. If we shall if, see. It, if if this keeps going on, if all this keeps going on, so uh, man, that that's about it. Ed, thanks so much for uh, helping me out. And uh, no problem, Ta- no problem, Taylor. It was my pleasure. It, and we will talk again Thursday at midnight again for episode one hundred and eighty on Spreaker. All right. Have a good night, everybody. And for Ed Smith, I'm Taylor Phillips. That wraps up episode 179 of the Detroit Sports Truth. If there's anything you fans want more of or less of on my podcast, please let us know. Spreaker's also, uh, the Detroit Sports Truth is also available on Spreaker. TTFN, ta-ta for now.